Yes, people, Killer Keller here. This is the Street Culture Podcast, Arts Arcade, Piccadilly for Keller Vision. This is the conversational space where we talk to people that started in the ground, street culture, and made huge successes globally, internationally, and beyond. Today, we have a very special guest, brand consultant, designer, with the man behind the brand sponsoring across the world of grime, drum and bass, hip hop, and more. He's got grounds in the streets, and it goes right the way through to beyond the streets. Adidas Compadre, the mighty Gary. Harry has been inside the house. Gary Aston, how are you? Pretty good. <laughs> yeah, pretty good. Um, you said just before we uh, we kick this off, um, you don't normally do this sort of thing, which I'm really complimented by. <laughs> well, I've listened to a few of your podcasts, and when you approach me, the fact it's coming from an angle where you're talking a lot about hip hop culture mm. and British hip hop culture. Um, I thought that's interesting because I get invited to do some of these things, but the subject matter, I'm kind of a little bit like, I've told that story before, yeah. do you know what I mean? And Dries uh, up quick, doesn't it? Yeah, and also I've just got to ask myself, what, what have I got to gain from doing it? Mm. I'm not, you know, like uh, I was saying, I'm, I don't really, you know, and I have to do publicity stuff because of my job. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't relish it really in the way that I maybe once did when I was a little bit younger because mm-hmm. I kind of think you're just putting yourself on offer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's, uh, it was quite a proposition on entry because I didn't... I mean, you have to be from the culture to get an understanding of what is, is forecastable, like hip-hop from back in the day, which is what we're going to get into and f- forward into the now more present time but uh yeah you've got to know the roadmaps haven't you you've got to know you've got to be into it you'll be interested well i think it's one of those things where if it's something you've been into you kind of almost have an instinct for it i always say that you know my career with adidas has been informed probably more by what i did before i went into Mm -hmm. academia because i didn't go to college until i was kind of 24 so i went there as a mature student and you know i was doing unpaid internships when I was 27 and I didn't start with my full-time job at Adidas till I was 29. So, you know, like, it's those years mm. before that, really, which were my real education, I suppose. The most informative moments. Yeah, just being in the right place at the right time, I guess. You mm. know, I I, uh, I grew up in a in a small town called Darwin, which neighbours Blackburn, in the, and, and, and kind of got interested in kind of clothes and fashion and that sort of stuff in the sort of late 70s, early 80s. Mm-hmm. And um, and then, I, you know, I discovered hip-hop and that was a really um, important influence on my life, really. And I think it, it kind of, my early teens, it really kind of carried me through and gave me a kind of a sense of purpose. An identity to what you... I suppose so, yeah. I mean, there was a whole thing going on. You know, it's very... I, I grew up in a two-bedroom terraced house. My mum works on the markets. My dad works in a mill. And so it was very kind of working class, one older brother. And, um, you know, and there was a whole casual thing going on. Mm. People call it the whole football casual thing was going on. But, you know, where I was growing up, that was... Um, there was like a contingent of people that were into that who were like just really violent and really racist. Yeah, That's the yeah, truth of yeah. it. And, you know, people can kind of talk about that through rose-tinted glasses nowadays. But it was pretty ugly, mm-hmm. a lot of that stuff. Mm. And um, and I remember some of the older kind of casuals who I looked up to, one day I sort of <laughs> turned a corner into a... I remember it's kind of like that, you know, and turned into <laughs> Almond Street and there was like a... A pe- like a pedestrianised bit in the middle and they've got a huge piece of cardboard and a boombox and they're playing this music that just sounded like it had been sent from another dimension. So or what year was planet. that? What year was that? that I, I was tr- I've been trying to work this out. I think it would have been 84. I, I always thought it was 83, but I think it would have been 84. Because... Mm. Um, and I, like I was like, what is this music? And it was like street sounds. It was yeah. Electro Three. Wow. The reason I'm saying it was um, eighty four is because that was the year Electro Three came out, and mm. they just got it. And so I went to Reedy's in Blackburn and ordered Electro Three on pre-recorded cassette, and I bought 
uh, Soul Sonic Force, Renegades of Funk with a Tommy Boy car sticker <laughs> in it. And, uh, and it was like, and, and, and that was, uh, you know, but these, these older guys, they were all wearing sort of, you know, Tashini and Feeler tracksuits yeah. and, and, you know, and, and it was kind of um, Adidas Gazelles and it was kind of, you know, but they were sort of rolling about and doing bits of footwork and trying to do backspins and stuff. It was kind of real primitive B-boy stuff, yeah, you know. Yeah. But I was like, what is this all about? And I was immediately hooked into that. And so there were three brothers whose dad had gone back to Nigeria and their mother couldn't, she couldn't, she, she basically couldn't cope with three kids as a single mum. And she lived in Epping Walk in Hume in Manchester. Mm. So these three brothers got adopted by a, a family in my hometown. And I got to know them and they were, they were really into the breakdowns thing as well. And I remember going to their house and they had a video recorder. We didn't have a video recorder at this point. They had a video recorder and they videoed a TV show called Bacchanal. And it was filmed in Covent Garden and it was Sidewalk Crew. And what? Dolby D was on their body popping with them. And it was, they were wearing these like baseball outfits and there was people doing like, at the back wall, they were doing graffiti, but it was kind of like I've super seen primitive this. graffiti. It was in Beyond the Streets, wasn't it? It was on the wall. Was yes, that was yeah, Fantastic. yeah. Well, that was yeah. a TV show called Bacchanal that was on Channel 4. Right. At this point, we couldn't even get Channel 4 in my house because the TV transmitter weren't <laughs> set up for it at that point. <laughs> but they had it on video, and I remember going to us. And then there was another one, there was another... Uh, TV show that they videoed and it had a uh, there's a crew called Roch from Rochdale called uh, Dizzy Footwork mm -hmm. that were on there and uh, some guy doing robotics that we used to laugh at yeah, called yeah, Norman yeah, yeah. Baker yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, but it was like you know it was like that you just get these little tidbits you mm. know like I listen to some of your other podcasts and people are talking about how important Buffalo Gals was uh -huh. and Wild Style and that but a lot of the stuff we were picking up was just stuff that had been recorded off the TV and like and how precious were they when you got them the videos oh, man, were you like, just wear them yeah. inside out you know yeah. but I remember sort of there was one with Dolby D with his cap and vest breakdancing in a park in South London and they filmed him from above doing a turtle crashing into a freeze you know and like you know and Dolby I spoke to Dolby recently he was probably the most televised UK b-boy yeah, 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 you know yeah, yeah. like the Blue Peter stuff and um, you know and I've since then you know I've, I've kind of dug around over the years I've I, I, I sent him something not long ago, which was London All Stars breaking on the South Bank with Paul Oakenfold being interviewed because wow. he was managing them then. That's so, correct. He was managing. The, yeah, yeah, Paul Oakenfold was like in the mix, wasn't he? Yeah. So, so we were in this small northern town, sort of getting these tidbits yeah. of information, but there was nothing for us to do but break. And like my my mum and dad's house, the front room in the in our house, mum and dad probably. I mean. I, I, they probably hate me for saying this. I don't think they could afford to get it decorated. So we had this empty front room in our little terraced house. So I said, can I, can I put lino down on the floor in there and, and can, I, can I paint on the walls? So we, we had this little practice room in my mum's house and sort of we got a little crew together and started going into Blackburn and sort of going to the shopping centre and, you know, battling. Your cool people. levels must have gone up. Well, 50. it was it was just a whole it, it was just a whole. Of, we got we got a sponsorship from some local kitchen supplier. Really, you know I mean? for to the buy, lino, to, right? To, to, no, to get tracksuits. <laughs> yeah, and he gave us lino, and he, but he also gave us a practice space, which was a nice big room. Do you know wow. what I mean? And so, so we. Um, but then I remember there was a crew from Preston came over to Blackburn one weekend called Mystic Force, and there were two big oh. crews in Preston. There's Mystic Force and there's Phase One. And Mystic Force came over, and I remember they just like because we were like the number one crew in Blackburn, yeah, and, yeah. and these guys are a little bit older than us, and they were of the same generation as Broken Glass from Manchester and Inner City from Bolton. Yeah, yeah. They were just a few years older than than us, and they turned up, and they were just they just hammered us. Do you know what I mean? We were just like we were just like we have not got any yeah, answer yeah, to yeah. what these guys are yeah. doing. They're doing crazy windmills and. And so um, we just went away and practiced harder and harder and harder, you know. And those Street Sounds albums were kind of lifesavers. It's interesting with the B-Boy thing now because it's become more sophisticated as time's gone yeah, on. Yeah, has, not it? Like, you know, if you were a kid growing up then, like, Electro 
was a reference point. And yeah. I know there's been all this kind of stuff in recent years. To me, it's felt like people trying to rewrite history where it's like, it was never called breakdancing, it was, was b-boying. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm like, well, West Street Mob, Breakdance Electric Boogie was one of those tunes. Yeah. That, you know, like the amount... And don't get me wrong, there were people like Break Machine or whatever doing street dance who I guess were trying to commercialise or capitalise on it. But, you know, like you saw... I remember, like... Um, Break Machine on top of the pops, like playing that video, We because we, we had a video at this point, <laughs> playing the video back and back and back and rolling around trying to get what we at that time called a continuous windmill. Do you know what I mean? So it's like your windmill is a windmill. Do you know what I mean? Roots levels I and mean, do uh, or die kind of shit. Yeah, and, and I remember sort of like just watching that over and over. But like they might have, like Break Machine might have been this crew that were trying to commercialise a culture or a culture vulture, whatever people want to call them. But actually seeing them mm. on Top of the Pops doing that mm. enabled me to learn how yeah. to... Give you the reference how, how, point. Yeah, of, get, yeah. To, to learn how to windmill. And so... So it was like we we just practiced harder and harder, and then there was a Lancashire Championship held in King George's Hall in Blackburn, and there was like Andromeda from Chorley, Phase One from Preston, Mystic Force, like all of them there, and we won the Lancashire Championship that night. And I remember like we were having to battle them all at the end, and it was like. It got it used to get a bit feisty, you know. Gary, so, this is crazy. So this is like, the com complete opposite kind of podcast. Uh, like, this is incredible. So you, so you'd be <laughs> dancing, and you know, it'd be like trying to kick you or trying to, you know, yeah. like be up rocking, and then like the punch would come. Do you know wow. what I mean? Wow. And and, um, and so we we kind of outgrew where we were, and also we were like, you know, we were a mixed crew, and there was a lot of racism in Blackburn at that mm -hmm. time. So we just stopped going into Blackburn and started heading south to Bolton. Mm -hmm. Bolton had a like a, a really yeah. kind of... Great music scene. Well, a healthy hip-hop scene as, as well. well. And, yeah. you know, we used to go to a place called Maxwell's on a Saturday afternoon, which was like a dance studio, and the guy had got onto the fact that lots of kids had found this new kind of dance craze. Really? And so, you know, it's like 50p or whatever to get in, but yeah. he, it was a huge dance studio with mirrors on the wall, so, like, loads of kids would go down there, yeah. and there'd be battles there every weekend. And we sort of outgrew Bolton, and then it was Manchester, and that was a whole oh, level. other level. <laughs> and yeah. took your whole your your whole later your well, earlier later teen life into a whole new dimension. Yeah, well, the thing was <laughs> the thing was the the three brothers. It was uh, Victor, Gabriel, and Soggy, Michael. But you know, the, 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 their mother lived on Epping Walk in Hume, like I said, and so we used to go over to Manchester a lot of weekends to see their mum. Right. So. Coming from a kind of predominantly white working class background, it kind of like it opened me up to a whole different multiculture culture. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And we, that was where we first used to see Sefton, Sefton the Terminator, mm -hmm. who's a seriously important figure in Manchester mm -hmm. hip hop. And um, so we used to go over, go over there on the weekend. So we we kind of. You know, we were familiar with Manchester, but mm. we'd never, you know, we never dared step into sort of broken glass territory because broken glass were people who, you know, Granada reports mm. again, mm. we'd videoed them mm. and watched them, you know, seen Patrick doing his flares and Danny Price's windmills and it was like, Price, they're a whole imagine. other level, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Benji Reed's body popping. Ooh. So like, we, um, we were, we, we went over on a Sunday to a club called the Satellite Club in Cheetah Mill. Mm. Now, Cheetah Mill, uh, what they did, there was a battle at the end, and it was like, Cheetah Mill this side of the room, Moss side this side of the room. And not everyone was from Cheetah Mill and Moss uh, side, but yeah, that yeah. was kind of loosely what yeah, it was yeah, based yeah. on. And because, uh, you know, we'd spent a lot of time in Hume, we, we sort of went with Moss side. Mm. And, um, and I remember um, kind of, trying to get my bottle up to go into the circle, do you know what I mean? Because it was like, and there was, and, and like there was, members of Street Machine would have been there, and there was another crew from Manchester that nobody ever talks about who were called Supreme Team. And, um, wow. So they, they, were, they were there as well. But I remember, I used to do, I, I don't even know what they call this windmill nowadays. It's a windmill where you kind of come off your stomach. It's like a belly windmill. Yes, I know that one. Kind yeah. of rolly, kind of, yeah, I, yeah, I know yeah. that one, yeah. And, and, um, 
and I kind of mastered that. That was one, you know, and, and I also mastered that into combinations. And I remember Noonie from Street Machine, Cameron Dante, serious, serious B-boy, going into the circle and doing that from the Cheetah Mill side. And I thought, I've got this. I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs> and I went in there and it was like, and the whole place goes up and I'm like, yeah. it was like. Electric. Oh, we can do this, we yeah. can do this. So then we started to, there was a kid called Paul Brown who was a, a saw dancer. I'd seen a couple of dancers from Manchester coming over to a place called Farmworth just outside of Bolton to a club on Sunday nights called Blighties. Hmm. And back then it was like, there weren't hip hop nights, it was, it'd be a soul night. Right. So they'd be playing loose ends and, Love it. you know, like SOS Princess, band. Say yeah. I'm Your Number yeah, yeah. One. And, and then there'd be like a 20 Beautiful minute era. interlude yeah, yeah. where there'd be a circle for them and they'd play some electro and people would battle, do you know what I mean? That's so, so cool. So it was like people, there was a guy called Rhino who passed away sadly, yeah, who was in the right. street machine. That's it. Rhino used to Rest come over to Blight, uh, Blighties with a guy called Swipe Master. So I'd seen them dancer and I knew they were, you know, mm. like another level. Do you know what I mean? And so we we went to Satellite Club and we're sort of like, there's so many good dancers in this city. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so, But we had a crew and we started to go over on a Sunday afternoon to a place called the Apollo Bistro, which is a, a, a club that was, it's just behind the Apollo Theatre in Manchester. Right. That was the epicenter of Manchester b-boying. That was the place. Johnny J was a DJ. It was Sundays, thirty pound prize money for the best crew. Wow. Street Machine used to go there every week and rely on that thirty pounds. They knew they'd win every week. Broken really? Glass at this point had gone. I think they'd gone on a European tour or something. You just didn't see them around. And Street Machine, yeah. like when you're dancing against a crew like Street Machine, your standard has to. Shape up quick. Be yeah. raised, you know what I mean? Yeah. And and uh, I remember one week, two of our girlfriends were on the judging panel and we got the £30. <laughs> we were lucky to get out of there alive. They were going to kill us, do you know what I mean? But, um, but then when we ever went, that's where I first met Shine. Uh, uh -huh. I think I might have even met him at the Satellite Club in Cheetah Mill. But that's where I got to know Shine. The Shine. And Shine was, you know... Graf Manchester graffiti artist and pioneer, Huge. you know. Yeah. But Shine wasn't really a great dancer, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. there were a few friends of ours that were like that. I've got another mate, Brian Beveridge, who dances with Jazzcatech, but wow. he, he, his breaking wasn't great. Mm -hmm. But when, when the Jazz Fusion thing came along, he really got into that, do you know what nice. I mean? And that was his thing, yeah, and he's yeah. still still doing it to this day, do you That's know what cool. I mean? Great era as well. Though. Yeah, and, and so, so we were... I got to know Shine there and we were, I remember like Street Machine saying to us, we're going, we're going to go battle Sheffield next weekend. We've got a coach. Meet outside Spinning. Spinning was a record shop that would get all the imports. Right, right. So uh, meet outside Spinning. We're going to go over to Sheffield. You can come with us as the kind of younger crew. And uh, I remember we got all the way on this coach and then the police get on the coach and arrested Justin from Street Machine. God knows what for. <laughs> uh, but Justin was, um, he was one of their best dancers, you know. And, and we went over to a club called The Limit in Sheffield and there was, we battled Steel City Breakers, wiped them out. Oh, and, uh, and Street Machine battled Smack 19. Wow. And it was, it was a big deal because... The DJ got hold of a copy of It's Just Begun on 12 inch, yeah. Jimmy Castor yeah, punch, yeah. you know, and it was like that record must have played, he must have played it about a dozen times that day, <laughs> kept playing it and playing it and playing it. And, and you know, the, the thing with the music back then, you know, it wasn't as sophisticated as it is now, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? So, like, I've heard people in hindsight criticizing Breaker's Revenge mm -hmm. by Arthur Baker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Breaker's Revenge was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You walk in the club, someone plays Breaker's Revenge, yeah. and it's like everyone goes nuts. Totally, you know what I mean? Totally. And, and like, so, so like, I remember us going over there doing that, and I remember me and Shine and uh, Soggy and Gabriel. Uh, we we stayed at Shine's house in Cheetah Mill. We had to get up at six o'clock on a Saturday morning. Mm. It was still dark when we got up. We got to Manchester Piccadilly. Got a train to London. We went straight up to Labrook Grove. I, I had my mum and dad's camera that we used to take on holiday. Shine had his camera, photographing the graffiti. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
because Manchester at that point hadn't really, you know, the graffiti. Because yeah. th the elements of hip hop were staggered here. Yeah, it great was, dancing it, it sounds was, to me like it was, it was the first few guys. Yeah. Him, yeah, like, and, and the graffiti thing only really started to take all old after sort of 84 with Subway Art. Yeah, yeah. When Subway Art came along, Subway Art was great because it was like graffiti gave an outlet for hip hop kids that couldn't dance like mm. we could, mm. if you know what I mean. Mm. Yeah. And, and so um, the graffiti thing kind of, you know, it was it was staggered yeah. from the breaking things. But I remember we got up early and we came down to London, we got to Labrock Grove, then we went to that Jubilee Hall in Covent Garden yeah, 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 to yeah. Freestyle 85. Wow. Chrome Angels were there, they had the original canvases, they showed electro rock. It was the first time I seen a DJ transforming live. This must you know, have been in the so flesh. informative. Oh man, it was it was unbelievable. Yeah. But but the thing was, they had it. You walked in and, and off to this side, there was like a stage. So the DJs up there transforming the graffiti piece. I remember we met Pride, and he was, so, and I wow. met him at Beyond the Streets yeah. last year, and he's still such a humble, modest, and he was, you know, Pride he could, man. I mean, I was 16 years old. He could see we were yeah. young kids. Yeah who travelled down from the other end of the country and he was yeah. really kind of accommodating, wow. you know. So, so, but I remember we were watching Live to Break were on the stage and they were wearing like cycling tops and, you know, Pervez had that sort of book four yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of herd. Big up Pervez, and, yeah, and, we're and, uh, cute. But we were in the crowd and we're thinking, oh, let us up there, <laughs> let us at them, let us at them. But, um, but, you know, the thing with Live to Break was what they were doing was quite sophisticated really because mm. they they understood the importance of style mm -hmm. like like from the way they were dressed to, you know they they could have been straight out of like yeah. the bronx or whatever the way they yeah. looked and the you know the pageantry but, of it all but there was not but but there was no power up there right and in manchester it was like you know like everyone was getting like double windmills Crazy, like crazy head, like head spins, like you know, nineteen nineties. It was all, it was all. Yeah, yeah. Because you know, like coming from where I came from, there wasn't, like I said, there wasn't much else to do but train, yeah, practice, yeah, yeah. train, train, train. So, um, so we had that experience, and the we had to get back to Manchester that night. So there was a daytime freestyle eighty five and an evening one, but the eight, the evening one we were too young for that. Mm. We were we were on our way back up north. But then, about a few months after that, there was a hip-hop all day in Manchester in a club called the Hacienda. I'd never been in the mm. Hacienda. And uh, so I turned up on a Saturday to the Hacienda and Broken Glass were there, Street Machine were there. Everybody was there. Mm. And um, when, we were, when we were there, like London came up. So there was like a couple of coach loads of London came up. Now the Hacienda had like a balcony and London walk in and London have got triple fat goose downs. Yeah, they've yeah, got yeah. they've got that like the they've got the claws, they've yeah, got yeah. the look. Yeah. You know, we're yeah. all kind of Adidas tracksuits, you yeah, know, yeah. like Street Machine used to wear uh, Kung Fu slippers. Really? They were dancing that was a street wow. machine thing. Because they gave you the grip, That's but they it. were really light, light. on the foot. Yeah. So like, you know, I, I would turn up to a jam wearing something like a pair of Adidas Century and we would, you know, have to go to a haberdashers to make our own fat laces to put in those things and iron your laces and like but dancing in a pair of Adidas Century, they were like they were so <laughs> clunk, heavy. Clunk. Do you know what I mean? They were too <laughs> clunky for the way that we were dancing, oh, yeah. do you know what I mean? And um but they were kind of but London came in, London looked amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Live to break, I felt bad for him. Really? I felt bad for him. Yeah, because I know you had Tough Tim Twist on here, and Tough Tim Twist and his mate Tommy, they used to come up all B straw. A pair of them used to wear black Adidas track jackets, I remember with white stripes, and they were always kind of sidled up to Street Machine. Yeah, yeah. And we were always trying to battle Street Machine, do you know what I mean? But they were a little bit older than us as well, but Tommy, there was a book called Casuals by Phil Thornton, and there's a chapter in there yeah. about the, this Hacienda all day that Tommy wrote, and he's talking about London All-Stars mm. being kind of like, you know, dancing against them. London All-Stars weren't at that event. You know, I think he's got that one. Mixed really? Up. It, was, it was live to break. Wow. And I asked Dolby about this. I said, well, you know, like... Yeah, yeah. They could have done with your help that day, yeah, Dolby. Yeah, 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 and he yeah, was yeah, yeah. like... He'd gone to LA at that point. 
But Live to Break... Don't like, went clear. He went clear. Like, that commerciality just sent him somewhere else, didn't Yeah, it? so, I mean, Live to Break were, like, it was just like people were just queuing up to battle yeah, them, yeah, do you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, and, yeah. like, they had great little footwork and freezes and stuff, but, like, they when really... you're going up against someone who's doing... Yeah. Crazy double windmills yeah. into like you know co great combinations. Yeah. It was doing like, it like their day job as yeah. well. Yeah. And then yeah. and then Sepo was there as well. And Sepo battled Sefton as beatboxing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Sefton pulled this little stump where he kind of acted like he kind of got something stuck in his throat in the middle of his thing, and the place went mad. And and like like me and Sepo, you know, our later years, you know, we were tight you know what yeah, I mean? yeah. he was like one of the first people i knew when i moved legend. down to london absolutely legend. and see but see but we, we'd talk about it. he said yeah he said we all came up to manchester on the coach we're all kind of ready for it he said well, the coach is back to london he said it was just like a mortuary <laughs> oh because <laughs> because he, he, he said it was like we knew do you know what Gutted. i mean yeah. And, yeah but it was um so yeah they were they were they were they were good times they were great times and i think you know a lot of that kind of Energy. I mean, the, it, what I liked on Tough Tim's podcast, he talked about, you know, guys told him to go away and train mm. because, you know, in the Apollo Bistro, he, he was dancing, but he wasn't, you know, yeah, like yeah. At, at the level top, that guys top, top like Nooney and yeah. Jason Orange and Neil and yeah. Justin and Evo and like like Nevison, they were they were at a whole other level to right. what Tim and Tommy were doing and. Mm. And he said, you know, they told me to go away and train, and I came back, and they'd all stopped. And, you know, and I stopped in 86, and I think everybody did, because you train all week, and you go out to a club, and you start dancing, and people are like, what are you doing that for? Yeah, yeah. Did the rave, the rave culture take a, take a swipe at a lot of the people that were breaking at the time? I think breaking was well and truly dead by it. Breaking, at like, kind of, in the UK, anyone that's, you know, I know that, you know, respect to Tim because he carried on, mm. but most people, like mm. of any caliber, had stopped. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Rocksteady had yeah. everybody yeah, stopped. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of like this trend in yeah. a way that had sort of run its course, and um, so the rave thing didn't really happen until summer '88, where the mm. breaking thing. For me, you know, I was kind of done with it before the end of '86. So there was, you know, and so there really I, was a big gap. Yeah, well, at that time in your life, do you know what I mean? It's like a couple of years is, you know, if you're 16 years old, it's a serious chunk of your life, yeah, yeah, do you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? And um, and so, yeah, well, I mean, the, the the rave thing, I mean, I... I, I mean, I, I stopped dancing, but it's weird when you stop dancing because you still get the, like, urge. Mm. It's still like, you know, mm. for you, I'd, I'd kind of... I'd still have this, like longing for it you know i was obsessed yeah. with it you know it's like it's all i lived and breathed for a few years do you know what i mean and and like and we yeah. had you know we had our own kind of in the uk you know you've got to remember there's no internet or any of that so like there were very few kids who could access the stuff that you would be seeing videos of yeah. from the americans so we kind of found our own you know like adidas shell tour superstars yeah nobody had them no Gazelles, Rare. yes, mm. like you know, like gazelles were our superstar in a mm -hmm. way. Gazelles were, and, and interestingly, when I met Ken Swift in the late nineties, he said gazelle was his favourite shoe to dance in, but that wow. was what we were wearing to dance in back then. But the rave thing, that was that was later, that was eighty eight, and you know, I'd left school at sixteen, got a job in an office, hated that, walked out of that after three months, signed on for a few months, and my mum said, I'm gonna kick you out if you don't do something with yourself. Mm. So I went back to college to do a foundation in art, messed about on that, spent more time in the pub than I did in college, got to the end of the year, I was having a fling with a girl who was doing textiles, she said, not many men apply to do fashion, I like clothes, so I applied to do fashion design. I looked for what was one of the worst fashion courses in the country at the mm. time, which was Manchester. Mm -hmm. It wasn't too far from home. I thought, yeah, I'll, and I knew Manchester pretty well anyway. Mm -hmm. So I applied to do fashion there and um, got a part-time job in a clothes shop. And the two girls I worked in the shop with, one of them, a girl called Fiona Allen, she did the door of the Hacienda. And the other girl, Rebecca, she was on the staff of the Hacienda. So they used to be like, 
you know, we used to work in this clothes shop and have a bit of a buzz and a laugh and they thought I was this cheeky kid or whatever. So, you know, they'd look after me for getting into the club. Always good to know a door girl. Always good to know. Yeah, well, the thing was with the Hacienda, there was a woman, like, really hard-faced woman who used to stand on the door. I think she called Jasmine. had, like, a really severe bob haircut with, like, security guys. And if you walked up to that club and you weren't dressed... If you weren't wearing, like, an oversized hoodie and mm. painter's jeans and trainers and outgrown hair... That's They'd be like, not tonight. So, so they, they were really stringent on the... the yeah, they the kind of curated who, who was coming in and who wasn't. Really? And, and, and I hadn't seen Shine for a couple of years because Shine, at this point, had gone off and be, got really into the graffiti thing. And I remember kind of bumping into Shine in there and him wearing, like... He's still got his fat laces in and his rucksack on, and I'm sort of like, Wah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, but but the, um, you know, the the whole thing was Blackburn, which a lot of those kind of hooligans from Blackburn um, transformed overnight to through Acid House, you know, fun loving, like, yeah, it was like you know, and and the racism seemed to it, it all just stopped, mm. it all you like the because. Blackburn was like, there was gangs in all different areas of Blackburn. And these gangs were, the, the, most of them were kind of, you know, would, they would scroll their name on buses mm. and write NF underneath. Yeah, things like and, that, and, yeah. and, and then it was kind of, so they, uh, but the one thing, you know, they had in common was most of them were racist, apart from the, the, the Asians, had a, there was a big gang of, from the Asian mm. community, they, they had a, Blackburn Muslim warriors, they used to call themselves. Wow, wow. But there was all these, you know, like, Hirecroft Demolition Squad, Wimberley Boot Boys, Blackburn Youth, Mill Hill State Fort. There are all these mobs. Hirecroft Demolition Squad. What Hire a Croft, name. Yeah. Hirecroft, right? It was, it was like, you know, that was an wow. estate in Blackburn. So there were all these mobs and, and they all hated people from Darwin and there was a lot of racism amongst them. And then Acid House came along and literally overnight, I remember there was a, 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 a club in Blackburn called Cella V. I'd just moved to Manchester, August 88. I've gone back over to Blackburn, to Cella V, on a Thursday night, first Blackburn Acid House night. And, um, like, we all went back to a guy's house after, well, it was like a kind of, a, a guy called Jimmy. We went to his place and it went on all night and then I got the first train in the morning back to Manchester. And that was the beginning of the Blackburn rave scene. Wow. And, and it went from Celeves <clears throat> to another club called Crackers. And it was just like a sweat box in there. And then from Crackers, it went to a club called The Set End. And, you know, from being 30 of us in a flat, I watched it grow. By the time it got to 1990, it was like... A whole 10, movement. 10,000 people in a warehouse. Wow. And people were coming from Leeds and Manchester and all over, really. I mean, I, I met... Um, I was talking to Dan Donovan the other week, right. Big Audio Dynamite, mm -hmm. yes, and he was talking right. about how him and Mick Jones came up to one of the Blackburn really? raves, which I, 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 I wasn't even aware of. It. Uh, one of the, the big wow. raves that we did in Blackburn was called Live the Dream. So I was kind of, you know, I was living in Manchester, but I was doing Hacienda Wednesdays and Fridays and then bouncing up to Manchester, on, uh, bouncing up to Blackburn from Manchester on a Saturday Jeez. and going to you know, nights up in Blackburn and then being kind of out all weekend. You're so immersed in the the history, fault lines of crossing over from hip-hop to, to rave, the, the, you know, Acid House era, and <laughs> unscathed? <laughs> yeah. no, well, I don't think anybody who really kind of raved came out unscathed. <laughs> I got sober in 93. Right. Um, I knew I had to ch drastically change my lifestyle. I sort of... The rave thing was done by 1990. You know, the gangsters moved in. Um, it was destroyed from the inside as much as from the outside. Really? I mean, there was a TV show um, that Tony Wilson used to do, Granada Up Front, and they got uh, Tommy Smith from Blackburn and they got Ken Hine, the Tory MP, who brought in the Acid House bill. Dude, so I remember this. Uh, Tommy was our yeah. spokesperson. So we were on one side of the studio and then you had all these like pillars of society yeah, on yeah, the yeah, other yeah. side from the, the council and the, the fire officers. Thick brown glasses. You know. but, yeah, but I think it, you know, I think Acid House kind of unnerved a lot of people from the establishment because it was bringing mm. kids together. Mm. It was bringing kids together. It was unifying kids, mm. you know, like, and... Um, they can't divide and conquer that way. It wasn't, uh, yeah. it wasn't politicised, but 
the fact it wasn't politicised in some ways made it more powerful. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, in the early days of the Blackburn parties, it was parties for the people, by the people. Mm. So they wanted, the you know, the main heads who were behind it wanted to put the message out that mm. this is not about making money. So any profit was mm. given back to the local community. So I remember there was a school... Uh, Blackamore School in Blackburn, they, they paid for riding, it was like a special, a, a, a school for kids who've got, you know, like learning difficulties. Yeah, yeah. So they paid for like, horse riding lessons for a lot of kids with wow. the money from the Acid House party. That's so cool. And the guy, but the guy, the headmaster's on the front cover of the local newspaper tearing the check, we don't want their money, sort of what? thing. Like, so it was, so initially it started out as like, you know, people believing they were going to change the world, but within a couple of years, all the, problems that you have in wider society kind yeah. of came into that. People yeah. got greedy yeah. and it just got nasty and it got ugly. And like a lot of these subcultures, mm. I think there was, in the early days of Acid House, there, were, there was like an unspoken code of conduct. It's like, if you're in here doing this with us, you must be all right. Yeah. And, and so people didn't rip people off or break in people's cars. Sense of in an people, innocence. Yeah, yeah. there's an innocence. People looked after each other, you know, mm. like, you know, jump in someone's car who's yeah. in the convoy. You don't even know who they are, but yeah. you're all on the same. So, yeah. Corruptive. Sad. It was sad towards the end. By 1990, I, I was kind of done with it, really. Yeah. And then I sort of hated what it became in the 90s where it became this sort of like you know superstar dj thing because yeah. i like the sort of democracy of the idea that the the real stars were the audience yeah, 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 yeah. you know and, and, when and that people, was the soundtrack to yeah and the were djs were great but people were going you know i'd come from hip-hop so yeah. people are going oh top dj and i'm thinking have you heard his scratch? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you know, totally. like, uh, so, so, so it, like, we without naming too many names, but you know, we we're talking about that kind of um, Ibiza era of um, unidentified DJs, faceless behind, you know, so the Tiesto sashes and the, those those sort of that that era of 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 dance and and rave. Yeah, I mean, Sasha, um, he used he used to be after my girlfriend, the girl I used to go out with him back then. And uh, <laughs> I remember the Hacienda put a night on in Blackburn called Hacienda Blackburn. And I remember it would have been one of the first times he DJ was was really? there. But then I think he 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 kind of really. I mean, 1990. It's all a bit yeah. whatever for me. But you know, I know he used to play in Stoke a lot. And there's a guy who I work with a lot nowadays called Gary McLaurin, who was also on the staff of the Hacienda. He was a, a photographer. He used to take a lot of photos inside the Hacienda as well. No one took cameras in there, no, but no. he was kind really? of like... So Gary um, Gary started putting on a night in Stoke called Shelley's and Sasha would DJ there, but I was done with all that no. by then. I was done so with it So what were you all. into once that had, you know, seen the light with you? Where, where, did, you, where did you want to go? Uh, well, like I say, I lost my way for a few years and then I got sober and I've been kind of sober ever since. So it's been 30 years now. So when I, got, when I got sober, wow. I um, reapplied to college uh, because I dropped out of college in Manchester after six months, ended up getting kicked out of the Alza residence, lived in a squat in Hume in um, Salter Square. And I, you know, it was like, I had to sort of like, I stopped sort of partying. It was like I had a bit of an identity crisis. Really, mm, it was like, what, what, what do I do now? Yeah. Where, where, where do I go now? And so I reapplied to college, but they didn't know if I'd be able to handle being in uh, being in an educational environment because of my background. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. they were like, where have you been? Yeah, like yeah. you went to college in 1988. <laughs> it's now 1994. Yeah, 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 what have yeah. you been doing? And I was kind of <laughs> like. Um, well, the so, rest of them were doing, to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyone with any sense of my <laughs> generation was doing. But they um, they gave me a place, and 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 I and I I ended up kind of I did two years, and then I came to London for a year doing internships. And while I was doing internships, uh, I reconnected with Evo. Mm -hmm. So what had happened was when I was at college, I went to college in Preston. I don't know where I heard about it, but I somehow ended up ordering a, a video of Battle of the Year. Legendary. And Legendary watching Battle of the it, Year. And I'm like, Germany. I'm like, oh, my God, 
Yeah. There's people out there who still are still, doing it. still breaking. Isn't that funny that Germany, they really did spearhead, like, it was almost like a, 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 an opening of a door of just like, oh, yeah, we remember that. Wow, they're doing it like four-wheel drive in there. And, you know, it's mad, wasn't it? it yeah, it was like, because you just didn't, you know, there's no internet. No. So you don't hear anything that's, you know, you're, you've, you've not heard about breaking for years. No. You know what I mean? And it's like, and then someone told me that, I can't even remember how it came across it, but someone said, oh, you know, there's a break in there. So I order this video straight away because I'm like, what's going on out? And, yeah, yeah. and I get it. I'm like, oh, my God, and look at what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. Because it's like... Different levels, different yeah, gravy. But, but, you know, I think that... And, and I think Street Machine, 1985, 1986, no one in this country was touching them. No. No one was touching right. them. They were number one crew in this country. Mm. I don't care what anyone says. You know, and uh, you talk to Goldie about it. Goldie will agree with me. Street Machine, I think, really were the ones that laid the foundation for what became power moves. Do you know what I mean? And, mm. and uh, there's some footage on YouTube of Street Machine at Rock City, and that's about the best, about the closest you're going to see really? of, of how great they were. But they were... They were just on a whole other That's level. That's incredible. I mean, for the, and for those that you are, are not familiar with all this, you can go digging, get into the Google and uh, yeah, discover these elements. Try and find us some gems as well. Comment below. <laughs> <You know. laughs> so so I, remem I remember getting that. And then I remember there's a club in Manchester called Home and it said UK Rock Steady Crew right, are, are performing there. So I, so I went over there and no one showed up. But I'm thinking, UK Rock Steady Crew? Like, who's giving themselves that name in the UK? You've got to have some serious balls to call yourself that, because to me, the Rocksteady crew were like superheroes. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like, you know, like... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't even put in... I can't even verbalise, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, how important they were. Yeah. You know, we used to... We used to get a bus to Blackburn and then a bus to Accrington on a Saturday night to a club in Accrington. So it was the only place you could see the Uprock video. And it was like we would go to Accrington on two bus rides to get to a club just to watch it's that really three minute video <laughs> on a Saturday. Wow. You know, with the blue and yellow suits. Yeah. And like, it was like, because none of us had that on video. Do you know what I mean? It yeah, was yeah. like. So I, I so I kind of heard that there was a UK rocks anything happening. I'd seen this Battle of the Year thing. I've come down to London. Anyway, I'm doing an internship, unpaid for Diesel Jeans in the press office, yeah. and they were going to open a store in Birmingham, and they were going to do a party, and the party was at the custard factory in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. So I got in contact. I'd heard that Evo had started dancing again, and Dizzy Lee, Dizzy Lee, amazing dancer. Another one. All these names, man. Street it's Machine again. Back, yeah. Street Machine again. Like, and so Dizzy Lee and Evo, we, we got them to come down to this party at the Custard Factory in Birmingham. And at this point, it would have been, what, 96, 97 or whatever. Nobody has seen, like, breakdancing no. like that. Yeah. But, I mean, Evo was a whole other level, you know, yeah. and, and uh, they danced at this party and the whole place just went into meltdown, really? like, oh, my God, have you seen... That? Like, it just made the party. And so we sort of stayed in contact and Evo said to me, you know, can you get any hookups? You're in London mm. working with brands. Yeah. You're trying to get on in the fashion game. And so... And, and I'd kind of reconnected with Seaport. And so we... Um, Ev I went to UK breakdance championships, the one at Hooch. Yeah, that's on, right. With Evo. Yeah. And, you know, he wiped the floor with everybody. He got his free PlayStation and whatever. Yeah, Crazy yeah. Legs was judging it. And and um, and I got him a hookup with Adidas. And the woman, at Adi uh, the woman at Adidas started sending him stuff. And she said, if you can link me with anyone else, I'll give you free trainers. I'm in my, you know, and, and at this point, I'm, in, I'm doing an in internships. I'm broke, yeah, yeah, do you know yeah. what I mean? I'm like, and, um, and then after he won the PlayStation Championships, the Prodigy were there. The Prodigy approached Evo and said, would you come wow. on tour with us? Now, the Prodigy at this point, this is a, like 97 or whatever, mm. fat of the land era. Yeah. Like they've got paparazzi outside their houses. You know, That's it's crazy. like... So Evo goes on tour with the Prodigy, so... John Fairs, who looked after the Prodigy, said to me, oh, can you get me a hook-up with Adidas for the Prodigy? So, yeah, of course I can. So then I 
I linked them with Adidas. So then I started, some of the people that used to come to the Acid House parties, what I started link like, because the Happy Mondays yeah. and, the, and like New Order and the, like, they would come to the Blackburn parties. So I started linking them to people to get myself free, free trainers. And um, plus I did an internship. I, can't, I haven't got the time to go into how it happened, but I ended up assisting the head of press at George Warren Marnie. Really? And she gave me this, I was like a kind of pet northerner. Mm -hmm. So she gave me this kind of project, which was to um, f connect with all the bands that, and musicians that Armani should be inviting to their events. Mm. And this was in the middle of all that Britpop thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, there was all the stuff Labor going on. With, and all that, yeah, yeah, Goldie was out there and Massive Attack and yeah. Tricky and there's all that other, you yeah. know, there was all, all this great music coming out of the UK. So, so I, through that internship, I got to meet a lot of managers and artists through that. Oh, so, man, so, that's now crazy. I'm, so now I'm connecting this woman from Adidas and this woman from Adidas leaves the, leaves the role so they've got my pager back yeah. then. Yeah. They've got my pager <laughs> number. And I think they thought I was some big shop mu music manager, but I'm doing my final year of college in Preston. So Adidas get in contact with me and said, we've got all these unfulfilled orders wow. for your artists. And I'm like, well, they're not my artists. I'm a student. So they're like, do you want to come down and see us? Because we're headhunting for a replacement for her job. And so... Timely sense of just... And it comes back to your passion of being into just meeting people and, and the culture. And all of a sudden you've got yourself into this Well, Well, yeah, and, and it was, it was, you know, like it was, I mean, I'd, like say, I'd, I'd sort of gone along to a couple of events with Evo and, you know, and that's where I kind of met Tough Tim again, mm. do you know what I mean? But I, like back in Apollo Bistro days, I didn't really speak to Tough Tim, he was, I, but, mm. but he was there, no yeah. question. You know, but like say, he was kind of street machine side. Yeah, 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 got you. We were like furious force who were going to go up against them. Yeah, yeah. So we were kind of, you know, like yeah. he's part of their kind of, oh. and, and so, um, wow. so, so yeah, so, so it was, um, I try, you know, I did go training with Evo a couple of times, but it's like my body just didn't flex like it flexed when I was kind of 15, yeah. 16 years so old. One of those things you just got to keep on keeping on. I think you? if you keep on your, your yeah. body, but if you, if you stop and yeah. then come back to it, but I'm yeah. saying that, you know, I'm sure there's B-boys watching this now who will go, yeah, I'm just making excuses, whatever. <laughs> just but, watching but, whilst doing a head spin or but something, it right? it was like I couldn't meet up to my own standards. It's like when I was dancing, yeah. I was kind of like, this ain't, yeah. this ain't what I used to be able to do, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I could have persevered with it and gone through getting injured, and that, but I just, I thought, nah, yeah, it's, it's, it's like, it, that was of its time, mm. I, it had its time for me. And yeah. That, so yeah, so then I started working for uh, Adidas, but that, I mean, I graduated and I had the initial meeting with them around the time when I graduated, so that was summer. Yeah. But then it all went quiet and uh, I was, I'd moved back to London mm. and I'm signing on again and kind of the bills are mounting up. Yeah. And I'm going out to these like f fashion parties. Yeah, high end and fashion. Pe and people are going, oh, what are you up to nowadays? And I'm going, oh, I'm waiting to hear about this job at Adidas. Mm. And then I'd be out at another event three months later and they go, what are you up to nowadays? I'm, going, I'm waiting to hear about this job at Adidas. And it just yeah. went, and it went on and on. And I'm thinking, the people are looking at me like, yeah, of course you're getting a job yeah, at Adidas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, the following February, I get the letter offering me the position. And I'm like, I still got the letter, you know, like first time I walked into the office, I'm like, logos there. And I'm like, for Amazing. a kid who would sort of beg, borrow and steal to get a new pair of trainers, I'm like, yeah. I'm in the belly of the beast here. So, you know? so let's stick with this for a second. So, you know, coming, coming from, like you say, that the working class areas of, of uh, the UK, learning a craft and breaking, and getting to this point that, like you say, there's no money in this. It's passion and love. Um, and then even then, pre-Adidas, you're still signing on. You're still trying to figure it out. You're still trying to get over that hump. Um, not knowing that what you've done previously would hold any gravitas to what you're about to happen in Adidas. What, um, I mean, how long did it take bef before you were actually, you know, you were making consistent money off of off of the back of that, all that hard work? And... Well, you know that that hard work was not with an end goal. That was that hard work was just because 
it's what we did. Yeah. It was just right place, right time. It wasn't kind of like, I need to build my profile. I need to, you know, I had no idea that kind of, you know, mm. rolling around in, on the floor in the Apollo Bistro was further, further on in my life going to kind of inform what I was doing. But yeah. I think it's the energy of mm. it. Me and Goldie talk about it a lot. Mm. It's like B-boy energy. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like you sort of, you know, you take that energy into yeah. whatever it is you take it's it into. the same into. with graffiti as well, you know. The repetition is key. Just keep going, you know, hit every tag. It's like, it's, it's, that, it's that desire, isn't it? The relentlessness. Yeah, yeah and, uh, you know, it was... Um, you know, I mean, I've I've been with Adidas in varying capacities now for 25 years. And, you know, I started there in the late 90s and I've watched the whole, what people call sneaker culture, like, you know, when I joined Adidas, it was 1999, it was like a pure sports brand. There was no Adidas originals. I remember the head of the company at the global marketing meeting in Berlin sort of thumping his fist saying mm. this is not a fashion brand and like you know wow. like it was like the customers were ahead of the brands in a way at this point i might to big up kish cash as well big up kish cash for uh, uh connecting as well you know another sneaker freak so to speak well this is the thing it's like because like i um i don't I don't subscribe to it when people talk about I'm like doing it for the culture. Because yeah. to me, that suggests there's a monoculture. And I don't, I'm like, I know what they mean when they say we're doing it for the culture, but they might as well say we're doing it for hip hop culture. Mm. But like, there's, there's, a, there's lots of micro cultures going on. 100%. And, I, and, I, and I, I find local, the, the older I get, whilst I was really influenced by American culture with hip hop, mm. and we had like a UK spin on it. Yeah. The older I get, the more interest I take in stuff that's localized. That's right. I remember interviewing Ken Swift from Rocksteady, and uh, Ken Swift came into the Adidas office, and I was like, most people in this office don't know who you are, mm. but I know exactly who you are, and I know exactly what you've done for this brand. God, I love and, that. And for, you know, if you ever need anything mm. from this brand, as long as I'm here, you pick the phone up for you, your family, whatever, because, you know, they've yeah, yeah, been yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so important to it. But it, it, it's, um, but I remember interviewing him and saying, you know, why was, like, Adidas so important to, like, the early... B boys, graffiti writers, B girls, yeah. you know, like wh why? And he was like, Bec because it was European, it felt sophisticated to us. Nice. And I was like, that's Ooh, it wow. right there, because you know, like growing up where I was growing up, it was we felt the same way about it, because there was like, you know, the whole thing with the the casual thing. Mm. There were yeah, there was there was kind of the football element, but there were also another element. Some of whom went to football, yeah. grafters who were yeah. just going to Europe and stealing designer clothes and stealing shoes, you know, and they yeah. would come back with these, like, Adidas shoes with names on them, like Stockholm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it yeah. all felt really exotic to us who were kind of, the best we were getting was, like, a two-week package holiday to Spain once yes. a year. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So it was like, so, like, with a lot of what I do with um, the range that I design for Adidas Spezial mm. is, like, I, I, I'm really interested in sort of, European reference points and mm. also the energy of between sort of these kind of often British subcultures mm. and what was a very conservative German sportswear brand and this yeah. it's, it's interesting you know the mm. idea of adoption yeah yeah and and um, so you know I mean when I, when I started at Adidas my original role was to uh, it was a job they called entertainment promotions because it was a pure sportswear brand mm. they'd had Britpop had happened and they kept getting requests for like Oasis or TFI Friday mm -hmm. or the Spice Girls or whatever yeah, 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 yeah. and they needed somebody to be the arbiter Filter. of what, what was right to do and yeah. what was not right to do and and you know and they didn't pay anybody apart from athletes and so I kind of ended up in that job and I sort of like made that my own. And it was, the challenge was making it understandable to people that don't share the same reference Ooh. points. So when I, when I first started at Adidas in the late nineties, I moved, like I say, I've moved to London and I reconnected with Sipo. Mm. And that was great because I didn't really know anybody down here, you know, and London's kind of, it's a big old place, mm. you know, you'd sort of, and so, I used to go to Sipo's house on Sunday afternoons 
for dinner. And his mum, Margaret, uh, would um, make dinner for us all. And Margaret used to adopt kids, you know, kids who come from troubled backgrounds. And so I'd, I'd be there and, and like, she had, she'd adopted this, this young man from Peckham. And he and his mates would be playing PlayStation. They were talking about MCs and they were talking about DJs. And I'm thinking, I've not heard of it. I'm sitting there thinking, I'm old. <laughs> I don't know anything that these kids are so talking what, what about. What years were we talking about this now? This is about 2002. So well like into your, your, your stint with So, yeah. A bit, uh, um, oh, no, I've, I've reconnected with Seaport prior to that. Okay. But uh, the, the stuff with the MCs and the DJs, this is about 2002 when I started right. to really pick up on that. They'd sort of and um, and I was like, "What is it?" And it was it was grime before it was grime. If what? you see what I mean, before it was cold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Grime and wow. and and, uh, and so I it reminded it was just it was exactly like me and my friends with electro, people getting imports from spinning all the stuff me and my friends listened to. None of it was. None of that stuff was in the charts yeah, back yeah, in the yeah. sort of mid eighties. Yeah, I was saying you know like when Dougie Fresh and Slick Rick the Shaw hit. Yeah. The top forty, we'd been listening. We rinse that record yeah, 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 out yeah. by that point. Do you know what I mean? Because we'd already had it on import. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. And so, and so it it kind of reminded me. So I kind of made it my business to sort of find out what what it was they were into, mm. and and kind of you know. And I started to. Seaport's uh, sister worked with us, Tembe, and she would you know connect us with these DJs and MCs and, you know, grime. and they were coming into wow. the Arios office and going, how do you even like know we even exist in a way? Do you know what I mean? Because wow. at the time it was so, you know, paying, so underground, it was so underground, you know, and it was brilliant. And, you know, some of the guys, you know, like Danny Weed, what a great kid, you yeah, know, yeah, like yeah. met some great people for, yeah, you know, we, around we talked that Slimzy time. and, you know, and, yeah, and that early era DJing, which really didn't have a face, the MCs were up front, weren't they? Yeah, and like you know, like I remember we hooked up East Connection, who were doing all mm. the pirate stuff, yeah. and you know, so Solid Crew, the second album, and, you know, like like I just shot the last Spezial film with Ashley Walters, and it's like a full circle kind of moment. It's like twenty years later, wow. here we are, we're both still here doing what we're doing, you know, and and um, and 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 then you know, like and. Then I sort of connected with the uh, Rewind magazine. Mm, yeah. No brands were cared about Rewind magazine at that point. We were the first kind of major brand yeah. to start working with them. Channel U kind of Channel era, U. We'd have yeah. Channel U on in the office, and then it just started to sort of snowball. And you would like there'd be some crew that we'd never seen before or yeah. heard of necessarily, yeah, yeah. and all kind of dripping in three stripes. And it was like it became, and you know, a lot of the artists at that point were saying to us, you know. We like the Adidas look because it differentiates us from yeah. US. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so that was, you know, that that was an, a, an interesting time, you know. And and, and like I said, Seaport, it was last year when they did Beyond the Streets. You mm. know, it was the first time I've seen Seaport's family since funeral. Wow. You know, like the Seaport's fu funeral was the last time I I, I I was breaking. Yeah. Me and Dolby, there's yeah. a circle after, and I thought. Yeah. If there's one time I'm going to dance, it, this is it. This is Do you it. know what I mean? Rest and in peace, Sipo, man. Yeah, rest legend. in peace. Real legend. Yeah, and, you know... It, yeah. So, so you know, it was... Um, yeah, that was that was the last time. That was the last time I was I, I, that, that I danced. And, and you know, it, but his family, I went... Uh, I managed to con get in contact with them after many, many years, you know, and Tembi's no longer with us as well. Mm -hmm. Rest in peace, Tembi. Rest in you peace, know. yeah. And, and uh, oh. so I, I got in touch with uh, his sister, Denise, uh, who, you know, and, mm -hmm. and then Margaret, and all the family came down because Maud too had done the Covent Garden oh. mural oh, with Sipo yeah. doing the head spin. And, uh, and it was like, you know got all the family there and was like, this is his legacy, you know, yeah. this is his legacy. Like, yeah. you know, it, it's like, and, and it, it was just great seeing them all, you know, because they were like, they really looked after me when I first came to London. Beyond 